for our needs and to get it to be what we wanted it to be, we're going to have to uh, replicate and do a bunch of work. Uh, we also didn't completely trust CouchDB uh, to store all our data, so we wrote our own index doc store in MySQL so that the data was in both places, um, and then we had code that synchronized the data all the time. Uh, we didn't, that was a bad idea. Uh, it turns out Couch was trustworthy and we should have done that work. Um, we didn't like Django templates at all when we used Django, and this was two and a half years ago. And two and a half years ago, that was a mistake. Uh, nowadays, it's probably not a, the mistake that it was then. But every week, we ran into something where we're like, oh, but we don't use Django templates, so this thing won't work at all. And then we have to monkey patch Django to make something work. Um, like, we couldn't use RSS feed because we weren't using Django templates. We couldn't use it. Uh, and it went on and on. And that's not true today, but it was true then. Um, and Django by default was generating an awful lot of queries, and so we had to actually start monitoring the number of queries that we had per page and trying to bring that down um, because it was getting out of control. Um, and <coughs> so because this project was successful, they immediately took all resources off it and okay. um, Awesome management decision. Uh, but they actually, I mean, on some level it made sense. They said, this thing gets you know, a few thousand page views a day, maybe 10. Uh, and then we have this other thing, SourceForge, that gets you know, millions of page views a day, and it's way crap. If you guys can fix that, make, in two months, make that thing better, uh, make, create this thing from scratch, can you make SourceForge better? Oh, and this time we're going to give you six whole weeks. <laughs> <laughs> So, in particular, they wanted, um, this is the front page, you had to redo the front page, uh, and they wanted to improve some usability. Um, so, this time, we got to choose, again, what stack did we want to use? Uh, do we want to just take the same stuff and use it again, or use something different? Um, we were pushing the envelope just a tiny bit on couch performance, on phosphorus, and we didn't want to do that again, um, because it was going to be a hard work to get. I mean, we had you know, thousand, two orders of magnitude at least more traffic. So we didn't want to. So we we're like, oh, maybe couch is not the right choice. But then we we're like, oh, there was this thing called. I can't even remember what it was called, but it was a, a twisted <coughs> front end that you could have multiple couch servers on the back end, and it would. What was that? Something like that. Um, and so we tried that and tested that, and we tried MongoDB, and we tried Cassandra, and we tried uh, several other options. Um, we did try Postgres and MySQL. Um, it was kind of all served out of Postgres, so we knew that would work. Um, but we wanted replication. Um, we wanted to be able to have each server be self consistent so that, or self contained, so that if eight of our front end servers went down and one was still up, you would still be able to respond to traffic. Um, so um, now we all know Python, meaning me and Dave. Uh, <laughs> we all had used a document database and we really liked it. Um, it worked really well for our problem domain, which is you have a project where you want to display a page about that project that has a whole bunch of data about it. But it's all basically the same data every time. Um, and we knew the problem would make a lot better. But we only had six weeks. Um, and we had to be able to handle more than 10 times the traffic. Not just more than 10 times the traffic that Phosphorus had, but more than 10 times the traffic at which Phosphorus would consistently fall over. Um, so we knew we were going to have some scalability issues. Um, we get a lot of download pages on SourceForge. And our project was just to fix the download page, the file browser page, and the, uh, sort of the consumer flow, the product <laughs> summary page. Um, and we were also 
one of the constraints, which was a pretty good constraint to have, I think, was that we were only allowed to talk to the public API of the source board. We were not allowed to talk to the database directly and get the data that we needed. We needed to grab product data out of the public API and shove it somewhere and then display the agents. Uh, it was partly to prove that we had public APIs and we could use them uh, because they were mostly broken in much of sort of like. Um, so we did a bunch of testing of various um, Various libraries, uh, I just mentioned that it was uh, more than 90% of all source words traffic goes into those four pages. Um, and then if you include the front page, it's like 93%. And then our next goal was going to be search browse pages. And that would take up to like 96 or 97% of all source words traffic would be served from Python with very little Python code, uh, but serving most of source words traffic. Uh, the big goals for it or to have bad slides laid out. Um, <laughs> or to improve the usability of the page, um, to improve the performance of the page, and to have a system that was much more reliable. Uh, we were having some downtime. The big usability issue uh, was we wanted to have this big green button that figured out what operating system you were on and let you download a file. Uh, because that didn't exist on source code at the time. There was just like a browse files, and then you'd get to a page that had a list of all the releases that had ever happened, and then you had to figure out which one you wanted. Uh, so we needed to do a little bit of uh, work to figure out what platform you were on from your user agent strength. Uh, and then we had to do some other work uh, to figure out what, because most file, most projects did not tell us what the recommended download was it was in the API and in source board, you could do that, but most projects did not have it. So we had to look and go, oh, it's 3.0 beta 4. Oh, that's better than 3.0 beta 3, but not as good as 3.0. Um, so we had to figure that stuff out. Um, and actually, we just, so for cheating, uh, in the original version of figuring out what platform we were on, we had code like, uh, if Windows can use a region strength that lower. Uh, and then we stole the code to figure out what is the highest version from setup tools. So we just imported setup tools and used their little do we do. Because it's crazy and I didn't want to figure that logic out. Uh, and we only have six weeks. Um, but that's sort of the beauty of Python, right? Like, I looked around and I'm like, hey, somebody has done this. And set of tools that it had, so we didn't have to write that program anymore. Um, we did have some uh, advantages, and again, my slides are being funky. Um, consistency wasn't critical. If someone uh, did a release, and some users were on ser one server, and they saw the release in four seconds, and some users on a different server saw the release and it took 10 seconds for it to get to them. Like that wasn't going to be a big deal. Um, we had, so we, for a database perspective, that gave us a lot of options. Um, we really wanted replication. We really wanted, um, when we launched, we wanted an architecture like this where each of the directory servers, the front end directory servers, had a local replica of the database uh, because it wasn't that big. And that way, as long as one of the servers was up, we were able to serve traffic. Um, when we went through and did all of our performance comparison of various databases, uh, we chose MongoDB. Uh, it was a little scary because people were like, oh, it's, it was pre-1.0. Uh, it was very, very new. It was incredibly fast. We were getting uh, over 10,000 project reads per second uh, in tests with project data on my laptop. Um, and 10,000 reads per second was more than enough to handle all source of traffic um, off of my laptop, which was pretty good. Uh, at least that's what we thought when we did the testing on my laptop. It didn't have production data. I'll get to that story in a second. Um, so uh, another thing that we used, um, all of our, our uh, administrators loved them some Apache, and they knew Apache, so I just said, here's Mongo. Uh, it will work, Apache Mongo, we're going to 
doing it, it's going to be fine. Uh, and that worked out as a deployment strategy for us very, very easily because it was something our system and administrators just just um, So we got, we had six weeks. Oh, they said, oh, hire two people to work on this too. So during that six weeks, we were hiring two people and getting this project done. Um, and because it was Python, that was actually not a problem. We did not work crazy hours and do insane things until the very last minute. And that was um, because they decided to change the entire theme and look and feel of sort of work, uh, two days before we launched it. Uh, so we had a mad rush to get a UI that worked. Um, but that had nothing to do with Python and just to do uh, design. But we launched two years ago at EuroPython. Um, and so this was bad timing, but I was coming to EuroPython to do a talk on Turbo Gears. And so I flew out, I landed, and we launched. <laughs> I bought the phone and then I'm on my laptop. And uh, the launch, we didn't have, uh, these are lessons learned, we did not have uh, any load testing uh, system. And we were not allowed to load test on production hardware. Uh, even though we had completely separate production hardware that was on a separate set of connections and didn't touch any of the other servers or back end. It was all touching like, the servers hit Mongo. Mongo was a new thing. I was like, let's load test on this before we launch, just to make sure it's all good. Uh, and they were very, very worried that we could somehow take down the site by load testing the site. Uh, before we launched it. So our load test was we just pointed all the traffic from source port at it and saw what happened. Um, <laughs> meanwhile, I'm on a different continent. I'm trying to figure this out. Um, and we launched it, and on my laptop, it was really fast, even with all of the traffic for source port. Um, but on the live servers, it was a little slow. It wasn't dying, but it was like, eight seconds of page, it was bad. Um, so the all server, the front end servers, we had four, they were just sitting there. Hardly any CPU, nothing happening. Like no load, no disk I O, we're like, what's going on here? Uh, and we look um, at the at that point we just had one central Mongo server. Uh, and we looked at that Mongo server, it had CPU load was like 5%, had no disk I.O. Um, we're like, why is everything slow? And then it turned out uh, that we had a gigabit network card in our Mongo server, and we were saturated with the gigabit network with project traffic because we decided to put every a list of every release for a project in the project record. For a few projects, like J JBoss would be a very good example. Um, there are thousands upon thousands of releases over their eight-year history of tons of little tiny components. Um, and so those project records were very large, um, maybe four megs. Uh, and we were grabbing them from the database every time we display the page. So we're grabbing four megs of data out of the database to display like a 130K page. Um, so that was not working out well. So, we're like, oh, we're going to move the releases out. But in the short term, our NetOps people bonded the two gigabit networks, and we had a two gigabit connection between the front end and the uh, front end servers and Mongo. And then we just saturated that um, immediately. And things got faster, but it was saturated, and that was the bottom line. And we fixed, then, like an hour or two later, we deployed a fix that didn't do the, um, well, we added caching first. That was an hour fix. Uh, and then, and when we added caching, things got really slow. Uh, we're like, why does memcache slower than Mongo? Uh, anybody know why memcache is slower than Mongo? Uh, because we're using Pickle. And Pickle is way slow when you have four meg options. Um, so when we we're serializing, deserializing, then we're also getting like CPU. Uh, Final processes and CPU final processes. There's a global terminal lock. Even though we had lots of threads and strings, uh, we're locking up. Uh, so caching into uh, memcache was bad. So we just started caching into local memory, and that worked better for just a few projects, and that eliminated it. Um, 
then we stop caching uh, finally now and just uh, remove the offending data that we weren't using at all from those records and everything got passed. Uh, but it took a while to update all the records to remove that data and put it in a separate collection. Um, so that project, in spite of that chaos, the Euro Python was deemed a success. So they said, do more. Um, and now we got to hire a couple more people, um, and we got set to replace all of the tools on the source board. And they wanted this time for it to be a platform. Uh, there was a, a big push uh, from a manager who used to work at Microsoft. Uh, he's like, everything's a platform. Platform is how we need it. So he's like, build a platform, and you can build some tools. Uh, and I was like, let's build some tools and extract the platform. Um, and then we built a platform, and then we had to fix it when we made tools. Because, you know, <laughs> that's what always happens. Um, so we built this platform called Allura. Um, and the Allura had a bunch of different, um, this is the Allura project, by the way, uh, tickets for it. Um, so we now we use SourceForge Ticket Tracker to track our own bugs and our own development processes. Um, and it has some built-in things, like it has solar indexing, uh, it has a Mongo <coughs> uh, document store, so a ticket, uh, you can just say, index these fields, and they, they'll be searchable by a solar. <laughs> um, we built a ticket tracker, a wiki, uh, file release system, git, mercurial subversion uh, supports, um, a discussion tracker, and a project administration control panel. Um, so we built all of these things so that you had a bunch of tools that were plugins. Uh, so installing a new, or creating a new tool for a, or a new tracker or discussion tool or something, is you, there's an application class that you have to write uh, and use a set of tools entry point. And then that tool will just show up in this menu of things that you could install. Um, so we have, as part of the platform, we have all of this stuff um, where we have Apache mod with me still. Uh, we have an SMTP server for mail coming in and out. Uh, RabbitMQ um, is now optional. You can, every, the queue goes into Mongo as well as Rabbit. Uh, and RabbitMQ just makes sure that people get the message instantly. If you're willing to uh, just pull Mongo occasionally and get uh, the queue to work. Without RabbitMQ, because people had RabbitMQ and it's all problem. Uh, we have this reactor idea that we stole. So we literally stole from the Python world. We stole this idea of reactors from um, Roundup of uh, Ticket Tracker, and then we index things in the Solar, we put things in Mongo. Uh, we have OpenSSH, and we have a Fuse file system, which we wrote actually in Python. Um, and all that does is permission lookup on top of a loopback file system so that get material subversion permissions can be controlled from Python without modifying the get material subversion binary. So we're using stock uh, version control systems that can give you fine grain permission control for access to those things. Uh, so we had six months to do this project. Um, it turned out to work pretty well. And so, uh, as we're about two months into this process, uh, someone at SourceForge decided that the official language of SourceForge is now Python. Um, and that we've done a good enough job that they proved that unless you have a darn good reason, everything that gets written from now on should be in Python. Uh, and so now we had to teach all of our PHP developers Python. That was easy. Uh, it turns out Python was great. Uh, and it all worked out. And in the end, Python just sort of won. And now the people who came in and did the original Python stuff uh, are in many ways running development these days and have led us in a new direction. And we open source the Allura platform that I mentioned there 
and all of the tools that we use on SourceForge. Um, we open source all of those this spring. Uh, so SourceForge is moving a completely new direction and I think has a chance to compete again. And it's because of Python. If we didn't have Python, we could not have done it. Uh, SourceForge was on a, I think my manager referred to it as a slow death spiral. Um, it was sort of, or circling the drain, that is the more recent metaphor that we keep talking about. Well, we used to be circling the drain, but maybe not anymore. Um, like, and we had more projects coming to SourceForge, we've had more traffic. SourceForge has been, I think, turned a corner since we started using Python. Um, so, you can say we have better management now than we did then. That's certainly true. Uh, you can say a, a lot of things, but I think Python is clearly one of the reasons that we've been able to turn it for. Uh, so that's all I had, and then questions. So we we uh, we were able to make those sort of switches. You know, 
dribble gear is really easily and not as easily injected. So that's why we made the switch. Um, and it turned out really well for us. We got exactly what we needed. <coughs> Um, I did my own assessment in terms of effort and time measurement or whatever, of what it would take to port the uh, Google Gear so that you find it. Um. <laughs> it's a very different subject. Um, Turbo Gears, um, we, we're going to work with the <coughs> Pylons and Pyramid folks. We're part of the overall Pylons project. Whether we actually rewrite um, turbo gears as such on top of pyramid is still an open question. Um, Pylons 1.0 is still supported. Uh, we can take over Pylons 1.0 support as part of this new project. It all works. Um, so we may or may not jump on top of pyramid. Um, we certainly are going to continue to work with them to build um, new tools and tools that work. Uh, for both us and Pyramid, um, Mike Orr's recent SQL Alchemy helper thing um, is something that I think we're going to incorporate. I hope that we're going to incorporate into Turbo Gears, and then it'll be incorporated in the Pyramid, and it'll make moving back and forth between those much easier. And my my hope and goal is that as time goes on, uh, in a not backwards and compatible way, we can move together to a place where we can write shared components like an admin thing, um, like those sorts of uh, site components that we can share across turbo gears and straight pyramid. And then if there's a new like, full stack layer on top of the pyramid, uh, that, that turbo gears and that will be sharing a lot. But our goal for right now is turbo gears should stay compatible with turbo gears. Uh, that's higher than moving on top of pyramid. Uh, we do not want to screw all of our users. Hi. Uh, my question is a, a, a topic. Um, uh, the source push seems uh, uh, or seems always a, a bit old times or to me. Um, the uh, popularity, uh, the impact of popularity of GitHub uh, push you the, a massive change to source watch. Um, I think Google code was the warning shot across the bow for source watch when they realized that if they don't do something, they'll become irrelevant. Uh, they didn't have subversion support. Like they decided that they were going to get better, and then it took them a, a while to figure out how to get better. Um, and really, like they had decided that they were going to try to compete with uh, Google Code and GitHub and, and those sorts of people when I started. Um, they were just struggling to be able to do it. Uh, and now they're not, I think, as much struggling to figure out how to do it because they have Python, they have a uh, talented developer team that knows what they're doing and cares. Um, and they had that before, they just didn't have Python and all of the tools that it provides. They didn't have a modern uh, framework. And they had many difficulties. There was a lot of chasing after the thing of the week. Uh, so you'd start a project and then never quite finish. Um, Phosphorus would be an example. We spent two months on that and then threw it away. Like we took it down. It doesn't even exist anymore. Um, but yeah, we are. Um, we want to be relevant in the open source hosting space. We are, in terms of downloads. We have way more, we have 500. This quarter, I think we will have 500 million downloads from SourceForge. Um, it's a big number, and it's a much bigger number than GitHub. Um, like a couple orders of magnitudes at a time, several orders of magnitudes. Um, so, we, we do know we need to make big changes, and we are doing it. Um, on that other hand, like, I'm also of the opinion that GitHub is a good thing, and there should be diversity uh, in the open, open source project hosting ecosystem, and I'm happy for them to exist, and I think it's
it's better for the open source world to have multiple options. I just think source code has to be a relevant one of those options. Was there a question over there? Or no? Nobody else? Uh, thank you very much, Mark.